One of the plants that I feel like I don't talk about enough and definitely deserves more credit is this one, the Alocasia Michelitziana. And as you can tell, mine is growing very big and very wild at the moment. And I've been looking at it for oh, months and I've been thinking, oh my goodness, there's so much I need to do to it. I really want to kind of help this plant to level up and bring out her best potential because she's growing kind of like a weed at the moment. So I thought it was probably a good excuse to do a little bit of plant TLC, take you through all the stuff I do to keep this plant happy, share some tips and tricks, all that sort of stuff. Just kind of have a really, a really in-depth look at this plant and tell you some of the mistakes I've made, some of the things I wish I'd known sooner, all of that sort of stuff. But first, if you're new here, hi, my name's Claire and this is Yoli. I make videos all about houseplant care, sharing tips and tricks that I've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And yeah, so this is probably gonna be a repot and chat meets focused alocasia tips talk. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoy it and I hope you find it useful. Let's get into it. So just a little overview of where this plant is currently at. As you can see, this is a plant that is in a pot that is actually a little bit too small for it at the moment. I'm growing it in pure semi-hydro. This is in Lechuza Pond. And for me personally, and I've spoken about this in other videos before, using semi-hydro for alocasias has been a game changer. Alocasia is a genus previously that I, I from time to time struggled with, especially actually velvet leafed alocasias. I don't know why, but they were just a little bit more challenging for me. And when I started growing them in semi-hydroponics, honestly, it just made my life so much easier. And I would say that this now is probably one of my lowest maintenance alocasias. So yeah, that's how I'm growing the plants. That is how I would like to continue growing the plants. But as you can see, there's actually two plants potted in the same pot. And if you look at the bottom, it's got roots bursting out. So that is definitely something on the to-do list today. But before I start doing anything, I'm just gonna give its leaves a little wipe down, not because this plant currently has pests, but just because firstly, I know it is quite susceptible to pests. And secondly, just because I haven't given its leaves a wipe down in probably about five months. And it's good to do it from time to time, as I say, to prevent pests, but also just to prevent dust and dirt building up because that essentially acts as a filter and means that your plant can't absorb as much light and it can't therefore effectively photosynthesize in the same way as it would be able to if you were to keep its leaves clean. Um, and I'm just using warm water with some horticultural soap for this. I will link the stuff that I use down below because it's absolutely brilliant. And I know I have said before with velvet leaf plants, it's a good idea not to get their leaves wet. And I absolutely do stick by this when it comes to misting your plants. And I've had people saying to me before as well, if they're not allowed to get their leaves wet, then how does it work in nature? Like when it rains, isn't that contradictory? And yes, I 100% know what you mean, but when we're talking about growing tropical plants in a home environment, typically airflow isn't as great in a home environment as it would be in a plant's natural habitat. And for that reason if you do keep velvet leaf plants very damp and you don't have good airflow it can lead to mold it can lead to mildew it can lead to fungal issues that can bring down your plant pretty quickly so as a general rule of thumb i would say don't mist those plants to be honest i know the benefits of misting are a little bit in debate at the moment anyway but i i'm not a massive mister nowadays but this is one that i definitely do not ever mist but yeah, as I already said, the main reason that I am just starting off by giving its leaves a little wipe over front and back is partly because of pests and secondly because of light. And when it comes to light for this plant, it is a fairly, when I say a fairly adaptable alocasia, it's one that can cope with growing in slightly lower lighting levels. And believe me, when I say lower lighting levels, I don't mean low light. I just mean probably the upper end of medium light. However, if you do grow it in those lighting conditions, what you'll probably notice is its growth is gonna be a little bit more stretched and leggy and the growth that it's giving you is probably not gonna be quite as big. So ideally, if you're able to provide it, 
bright indirect light is best for this plant and I live in the UK and my Alocasia michelitziana lives right up against my south facing window. I'll put a clip in so that you can see she literally, especially at the moment, is literally pressed up against it and she seems really really happy like that. The one thing you do need to watch out for is if you have just got your plant or you're moving her to a slightly higher light spot, you do just need to make sure that this is a gradual process and you're not doing it suddenly because if you don't acclimate your plants slowly, then they can go into shock, they can burn, there can be all sorts of issues. And I have definitely learned this the hard way many, many times with my plants. So yeah, if you do want to move this plant, I mean, it applies to moving it to lower light as well, but I think typically the more dramatic issues tend to occur when moving a plant suddenly to higher light. I would say just kind of transition your plant slowly and gradually over time. Don't suddenly pick it up from a spot in the corner over there and move it right in front of the window. Move it maybe like a meter a day or something like that so that it has time to adjust. But yeah, the other thing that you want to think about when it comes to lighting for this plant, and I know some people don't mind this too much, but if you do want your plant to not just be facing one way and you want its growth to kind of be lovely and 360 and rounded, then it's a really good idea to turn your plant on a regular basis. And to be honest, mine is a very good example of not doing that because as you can see, all of its growth is very much just facing one way. And that is purely for the fact that I am a little bit lazy from time to time and I don't don't get around to turning the plant as much as I probably should. But with some types of plant you won't really notice if you don't do it for a few weeks, whereas this is one that is very, very quick to chase the light. So if you think of it just every every few days, every week, just give its pot a spin and then it's able to absorb equal amounts of light from all angles and you won't get it leaning in the way that mine is now. And with this plant, a really common question that often comes up is why does it cycle so much? Why do older leaves die off? And to be honest, that isn't specific to the Michelitziana. It is very much a known alocasia thing. Lots of different species of alocasia within the genus are known for doing this. And light can absolutely be a key factor in this. It can come down to a few different things that I'll talk you through in a minute, but light can absolutely be very, very important in preventing this from happening. And often it's just because if your plant doesn't have enough energy reserves to be able to support more growth, then it will essentially let go of its older leaves as it starts to produce newer leaves because it's essentially not capable of upkeeping the older growth with the new growth, if that makes sense. And this is why very commonly over the darker winter months, you'll notice alocasia start to do this more. For example, I'm not sure if you can see, but I've got my big alocasia portadora behind me here. And this one's currently stuck in the two leaf pattern because I've got it just back from my window. It does really need to be receiving better light, but I haven't got a grow light on it. So for that reason, pretty much every single time a new leaf starts to emerge within a few days to a week, the older leaf will start to drop. And that means that I just have to trim it back and this also very commonly happens when you first bring an alocasia home like for the first few months that you own it again this can come down to what i said before about acclimation which is basically just the process of your plant transitioning into life in your space and getting used to things but while it's doing that and some types of plant are more hardy and resilient than others, but alocasia, if you can tell by the way I'm speaking about it, can be quite a sensitive and dramatic genus. So it is very, very normal for it to lose a few leaves at first. If it's, if it's losing all of its leaves or if the cycling's happening a lot, then that's when maybe you need to kind of reevaluate what you're doing, but it can be completely normal. And as I say, I have lost more leaves on this plant over the winter months than I have done in the summer. It tends to hang onto its leaves much more when the light's better. Okay, so now I've given all of its leaves a really good wipe off. I'm going to get it out of its pot. Have a look at the roots and see what needs to be done here because I can see this plant is incredibly root bound. And in fact, some of the roots that are coming out of the bottom of the pot here mean that I can't actually get the plant out of the pot. So I'm gonna just take a clean pair of scissors and I am just gonna trim these back. 
And I know some people are very scared of root pruning. They think it's gonna disrupt the plant. They think the plant's gonna not be happy because of it. But if you've got a well-established plant like this, root pruning can actually be a really positive thing for the plant, kind of in the same way as stem or leaf pruning can be, because it can just essentially help your plant to push more of its energy into, in this case, making a fuller and more kind of beefy root system. For that reason, often if you trim back some of the spindly roots, some of the ones that aren't quite as, wow, well established, this can be a really good thing for the plant. So when I'm working with semi-hydroponics, you don't actually, it's not like soil, you don't need to get all of the semi-hydro off it. But I'd like to try and just have a look and see if I've got any corms here. Ah, in fact, I can see one right away so that I can talk a little bit about propagating this plant as well. Look at that. So yeah, if you're repotting your plant and you come across these, don't throw them away because this is how you make more of this plant for free. <laughs> and as I'm going through and I'm removing the semi-hydro, I'm not being too precious about these little spindly roots for the reason that I just said. And as you can see, she's incredibly rooty, so she can definitely afford to lose a few here and there. So when it comes to watering for this plant, obviously, as I have already said, and I've showed you, I'm growing this one in semi-hydroponics. I haven't always grown this plant in semi-hydroponics, so I'll talk about watering as if you're growing this plant in soil to begin with, and then I will talk a little bit about how I water. But if you are growing this plant in soil, Although alocasia is one that does like to remain fairly moist, I actually found that watering them a little bit less than I water my calatheas for this one is what it seemed to like the most. So I wouldn't keep it hydrated the whole time. I would allow probably the top inch of soil to completely dry out. And when it had, then I would go and water it again. And also as with all of my plants that I've got in any kind of organic matter, I would always make sure that the pot had good drainage. So for example, any excess water that the plant didn't need when I did water it could just run off the plant. Because if you do keep it in a pretty pot cover or a ceramic pot or anything that doesn't offer good drainage, and I know nowadays this is often how these plants are sold because they're sold as just kind of like, I don't know, nice things to look at. People don't think about the care needs of the plant. A lot of the time, it's very easy for your plants to develop issues such as roots rot, because as I say, you're just not able to properly monitor the root system and a healthy plant always starts with healthy roots. So yes, how I, how I choose to grow this plant is semi-hydroponically. And that means that I'll use this, this substrate here. As I say, this is what I'm using here is Lechuza Pond, but there's lots of semi-hydro alternatives. Soil Ninja also make a really fantastic semi-hydro equivalent that I will link down below. But this mix essentially consists of pumice, zeolites, lava rock, all sorts of stuff that is not organic. So it's much harder to overwater your plants. And what you will essentially do is you'll grow them in a reservoir of water and the semi-hydro will absorb lots of water and then your plants will essentially feed off however much they need. It is, it is possible to overwater, like for example, if you were to keep a sky high reservoir at all times, then your plant might not be particularly happy, but I have never had issues with that, doing it this way with alocasia. So as I say, that is personally what I would recommend. Going back to the alocasia cycling as well, in terms of losing leaves, I found that my alocasias, in fact, all of my alocasias cycle much less when I grow them in semi-hydro as opposed to soil. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but I think they just like it more. They just seem to prefer it more. And as I say, usually I wouldn't be, whoa, I wouldn't be too worried about getting all the semi-hydro off the roots, but I am finding so many corms here. And I'd love to get some baby, some baby alocasia fridex going. Also just by dividing the corms from the mother plant, again, that just allows the mother plant to be able to conserve her energy and put that into new growth instead of essentially growing new babies. So it's a really good idea to just remove them as and when you see them. But it's one that I really enjoy growing from corms actually, and it is fairly straightforward to do. So as I say, I'll get this repotted and then I will take you through how I do that. 
And going back to watering, I know something else that people often ask is whether or not alocasias require specific water, because I know there's some types of plants that need to only have filtered water or only have distilled water. And where I live, in my experience, tap water has been absolutely fine, but I know in some parts of the world, the chemicals and minerals can be slightly higher. Um, if you're able to use reverse osmosis water or distilled water, then absolutely, if you've got access to it, rainwater, in fact, as well, then yes, I would recommend it. But I haven't found it to be particularly fussy in that area compared to some of my other plants. Um, so yeah, as I say, for me, that hasn't been an issue. And when it comes to fertilizing this plant, I, I've spoken about this in my videos before, but I used to be someone that would only fertilize over the spring and summer months, over the growing season. And I have massively, massively changed my mind on that in the last few years. The fertilizer that I use is called Liquid Gold Leaf. And I honestly swear by the stuff, it is amazing. I've banged on about it before, not sponsored at all. I just think it's awesome stuff. And I use it on all of my house plants all year round. So so long as they're actively growing and I know some people say well how do you know if a plant's actively growing like if you've got a slow growing plant how can you tell if it's in an active state or not and with alocasia it's usually it's usually pretty easy to tell I mean this one is almost always giving me a new leaf of some sort you can see it's getting ready to push out a new one just there but if it's not actually giving me a new leaf then usually I can tell by whether or not the stem's swelling and if it's swelling then it's typically kind of getting ready to start producing a new leaf um so yeah I fertilize this one currently all year round and with liquid gold leaf it does have all of the instructions I think on their website about how to use it with semi-hydroponics I'm not that strict with measuring to be completely honest which is probably not good advice to give but I will just dilute it ever so slightly compared to how I water my plants in soil or in an organic matter for example um, I'll typically go around and I'll do all of my plants that I've got in soil and then I will just add a little bit of water into my watering can on top of what I've already got in there of liquid gold leaf um, I've never had any issues. It's very hard stuff to over fertilize with, but obviously depending on what brand you're using, read the instructions, always follow the instructions. Um, and as I've said before, if you're in any doubt, start with a little bit less than it says and then gradually build stuff over time. I am, um, oh my God, there's so many gorms. Uh, I had a pothos plant, I, I can't remember how long ago, I think probably getting on for six years ago or something. Um, and I'd had it for years and years and years. It's a very hardy plant. It had never given me any grief. It was growing quite slowly. And I picked up some fertilizer in a garden center and I'd never really used fertilizer before. And I thought, this will help the plant. And because I didn't ease that plant into it, because it had got used to living in a very low nutrient substrate, when I did fertilize it at the rate it says on the bottle, it completely sent the plant into shock and I lost a load of leaves. And I think, I think I'm right in saying the plant actually died. Um, so yeah, if you're in any doubt, start with less, gradually build stuff over the time, essentially acclimate your plant to fertilizer. Okay, so I've got about 90% of the semi-hydro off and that is what I'm left with. It is a ginormous root system. And what I am gonna do is I'm just gonna peel, these are some of the lower leaves, the leaves that I've pruned back. I'm just gonna peel the brown off them just because that makes the plant more susceptible to rotting. And what I want to do when I pot this, when I pot size this one up is I just want to pot it a little bit deeper because that will just allow these sections here on the stem to start producing aerial roots, kind of in the same way as they've done just there. Um, and that just means that further down the line, if I want to chop and propagate this plant, then I can do it that way. But if, even if I don't, it just allows the plant to have a much stronger root system. If hypothetically I was to have root issues such as root rot, I can chop it much easier. The plant's just gonna be much happier basically. So yeah, I'm just removing those bits before I put it up. And it goes without saying as well, I could absolutely divide this so that I had two separate plants in two separate pots, but I really like how it's growing as a big full plant like this. So I am going to, I'm gonna keep it like this for the time being. Um, and this is the pot that it was in. And this is the pot that I'm gonna change it into. So it's the same style tower pot, but as you can see, this one here is significantly bigger. I think this is about 15 centimeter. 
um, and just giving it a little test with the roots. I think that should be perfect for this plant. And the only thing I'm gonna change substrate wise is I'm actually gonna go in, this is quite a fine mix that I've been using, which although the plant's been very happy with, I'm gonna go in with something a little bit coarser this time. Oh my God, that bag is heavy. Um, I'm gonna go in with, again, this is Soil Ninja mix, and it looks more like that. As you can see, the chunks are just a little bit bigger, and that just allows for a little bit more aeration around the roots. Again, less susceptible to things like root rot, and not that I've had any issues with that with this plant, but I'm just being, being careful. Um, and one thing I'm gonna do as well, just at the bottom of the pot, is with my old pot, I actually put little bits of net from, I think these are actually used to contain onions, um, but just to stop the semi-hydro falling through. But another thing that I often do is I'll just use leka, which is these clay balls. I'll just put some of those at the bottom. They just look like that. Um, yeah, I'll just put some of those at the bottom of the pot, just so that I don't get bits of it falling out. But the next thing to think about when it comes to caring for this plant is temperature. Um, and I've actually grown this plant in quite a few different environments over my time of owning it. And so I've kind of been able to experience it in different temperatures. And the way that it's growing at the moment is probably the happiest I've seen it, to be honest. It was growing in my mum's conservatory before. Um, and the temperature in this room, it tends, to, it tends to fluctuate from about 18 to 25 degrees. I will try and keep it as stable as possible, but that tends to be the average temperature. And that seems to be the conditions in which this plant has thrived the most. Alocasias don't do particularly well with big fluctuations in temperature, as I've just said. So a steady temperature is what you should aim for. Obviously, it's going to drop a little bit lower at night. But so long as it's not constantly going up and down, that should be totally 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 fine if you do grow it in colder conditions though again its growth is likely to be much slower because it's not as representative of what it would be receiving in its natural habitat so if you can up the temperature a little bit for it if you're in the UK or a colder country like I am then that would be ideal Essentially, I mean, this goes for all tropical plants, but essentially you just want to be looking at their natural growing conditions and seeing how you can attempt to replicate just a little bit of that in your own home. Because plants are way more adaptable than we give them credit for. Like none of the plants that I own, and I've, I've got about 300 plants, and none of the plants that I own are growing in the exact conditions they would be growing in in their natural habitat, but they're all growing pretty well on the whole. So yeah, it's just taking that and using that in whatever way you will. But on a similar note to temperature fluctuations, the other thing to take into account is cold drafts. I mean, cold and hot drafts, but more commonly you tend to get cold drafts. And so this is a plant that really does not like that. So if you've got drafty doors or windows or air vents or anything like that, just be very, very careful of that with this plant. Oh, and I've just realized as I'm doing this, there's something else that I was going to do that I might actually be able to add in now. I should have thought of this earlier. Um, but basically, this, this is inspired by Marianne, who's someone on my Patreon. And oh my goodness, I got some people on my Patreon to send in their own houseplant tours recently, and I got to see some of your collections. They are absolutely stunning. But as I say, Marianne did this amazing thing with her allocation. She had a copper wire essentially running around them, holding all of their foliage up, because as I say, mine is growing pretty crazy at the moment. And I keep meaning to buy copper wire and try it because I thought it looked beautiful and it helps to keep the plant happy. I don't have copper wire, but I have got this wire here, which I just use for arts and crafts and stuff. And long term, I don't know about how it would interact with water and semi-hydro, so it's not a long term fix, but I thought I would just try it today. It might not work, but I thought I would just try it and see if I could get it doing what hers was doing because it just worked so well. So yeah, I've essentially made this, I folded it back on itself like string. I should have potted this right at the bottom, but I can see a gap. I'm gonna just stick it down to the bottom of the pot. 
and then I'm gonna wind it in kind of like a spiral shape. And it should help to support the plant. Is this gonna work? I don't know. Okay, bearing in mind the plant is currently very much growing with all of its foliage facing one way. I haven't finished adding in the semi-hydro, but I think it's kind of worked. I think it's kind of worked. I'm gonna finish potting it up and then I'm gonna see how it looks. But I think the next thing to talk about is probably humidity for this plant. Um, Cause, oh my goodness, I'm making a right mess. Um, because as I say, this is a tropical plant. It does naturally grow in quite a humid environment. Alocasias are again, very well known for loving humid conditions. But this is one that I found doesn't need quite as much humidity as some places on the internet are telling you. Like when I first got this plant, I was told that you should be growing it at like 90% humidity and that is just not realistic. And again, unless you've got really fantastic airflow, very high humidity with velvet leaf plants can lead to mold and mildew and all of that sort of stuff. And I don't just mean on your plants, in your home as well. So airflow, 100% an important thing. But in my home here, where I live, I do run a humidifier from time to time, but the standard room humidity tends to be around 50-60%, and that has been absolutely fine for this plant. I've had no issues. Its leaves, I think, look really lovely and conditioned. It hasn't caused me any drama whatsoever. So that is that is just how, how I'm growing the plant. And so, yeah, I know firsthand that it can be very much possible to grow it in lower humidity levels. And I don't think this spiral thing I've made has worked quite as well as I wanted it to. And it definitely doesn't look as lovely as the woman's that I was trying to copy. But as I say, I haven't used quite the right materials. But I think it's definitely achieving, achieving keeping the plant a little bit more upright, which is good. Uh, so yeah, as I say, now what I'll do is I'll just put this plant into a container where I can fill a reservoir. I'll keep its reservoir filled to about there, roughly. If it does dry out a little bit from time to time, that's not the end of the world. You can also use self-watering pots. They're very good. They kind of tell you when you need to fill the reservoir. But this is just a really good way of doing things for this plant, in my experience. I'm going to pop it just behind me for the time being. Oh, doesn't it look gorgeous? That looks so pretty. But then at the corms that I'm left with, oh my goodness, I have got a lot of them. Look at all of those. Those are all corms that I've just taken off the plant as I've been repotting it. Um, and I actually only brought one container over, so I'm gonna show you an example of what I do to propagate this plant, and then I will take the others over to the sink. In fact, some of these very brown ones might need a little bit of a scrub. They can be all right if you don't remove the brown, but sometimes if you don't kind of just remove the excess outer, I wanna say like outer skin of them, they can be more prone to rotting. So I might just keep a few of them to one side. Uh, I've got some here, actually, I've got three that are really quite kind of clean looking and I'm going to use them as an example. But what I'll do is I'll just take a little container like this. I think this is just an old hummus, hummus tub or something like that. And I'll just pop a few corms in it. And then you can, you can do it a few different ways. But the way that I really like doing it at the moment is just getting a little bit of tap water and making a really thin layer of water. Like that is literally, I don't know if you can tell, but that is like a millimeter of water. It's barely enough to just cover the bottom. And then what I'll do is I'll cover that in cling film, leave it somewhere fairly light, fairly warm. I will just occasionally take the cling film off and just make sure, I, I smell it to be honest, just smell it to make sure they haven't started to rot because if they do rot, then you need to change things up pretty quickly for the ones in there that haven't rotted, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I will just I, I will just leave them covered and then hopefully in the next kind of three, four weeks, you should start to notice them root and then sprout. Uh, and so yeah, I'm hoping I'm gonna have lots of lovely babies of this plant. You can just, as I say, put these ones straight into either water or sphagnum moss like this. And I have done that before and they haven't rotted, but it does just make them a little bit more susceptible to doing so. So I am just gonna probably give these ones a little scrub with a nail brush at the sink and then pop them in here as well. 
but yeah, I'm really happy with how this one's how this one's looking. I think she's looking much healthier and much more upright than she was when I started this video. And I really hope that you found this useful. If you have, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day, and I will see you in the next video. Stay sexy, plant lovers.